Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to another FSR debate. Um, this one is on the regulation of storage across vectors. Um, we have um, a number of uh, presenters and panelists uh, to introduce the subject and also then to discuss the subject. We will also have for the audience uh, three polls, which we will run immediately after the introductory remarks from the panelists. Uh, so please um, uh, contribute to, to, to our discussion, uh, also from the audience uh, through uh, participating in the, in the polls. And also later on, we'll have the opportunity for questions and answers. So please send us uh, your, your questions uh, throughout the, uh, the event. Uh, using the facility in, in the connection, the question and answer facility. Um, I don't have much else to do um, now, so I will uh, now turn to Lee, who has been um, co-organizing these debates with me, to introduce the one of today, Lee. Thank you very much, Alberto, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is Lee Hancher, and uh, indeed, uh, Alberto and I coordinate this uh, monthly series today. We're looking then at, at storage across the vectors, and um, that's a, a challenging subject, uh, given that from a regulatory point of view, we've really only ever regulated gas storage in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, electricity storage has sort of crept in now as a bit of an afterthought in the uh, in the clean energy package, but gas storage, of course, has been regulated in the uh, gas directives for, for some time. Um, and the question before us today is, well, what system um, can we look at uh, or look towards in designing a regulation of storage for the whole energy market? If we leave behind the, the usual starting places of, of gas and electricity and start thinking in terms of, of the whole energy market, where should we locate storage um, and how should we regulate it, if at all? Um, and what types of regulatory methods, if we choose to regulate it, should we be thinking about? So we have uh, with us today um, a number of experts to offer um, some guidance and some, I think, offer questions as well, not always answers, because uh, at this stage of the discussion, and that's what makes it so fascinating, I think there are many more questions than, than answers. Um, so we um, will start with um, our two speakers today. And I would like to introduce, first of all, uh, Ronnie Belmans um, from the University of Leuven and Energieville in Leuven, um, known to, to many at the FSR um, for um, always coming up with um, a challenging uh, approach to, to all subjects. So first of all, Ronnie, I'd like to invite you to take not the floor, but the screen. Thank you. Okay, Lee, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here, and I hope you see the screen, my slides. Yep. Okay, uh, also Alberto, thank you for uh, trusting me to give this start, starting this introduction. And when I was asked to, 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 to make this introduction, uh, the first thing I came up to my mind is what are we talking about? Uh, and what are we going to talk about? And most of the time we think of electricity storage and then we have those nice pictures by, like by Holton in here saying that we need storage from balancing real time to intraday, day ahead, long term and generation and transmission planning. And we need to have advocacy, then we need storage to keep the system going, period. But is this about energy storage? No, it's electricity storage. And we have to think energy. And energy is not always regulated. A part of it is regulated. Part of it is not regulated. We know that the grids are regulated. We know that generation is non-regulated business. But there is also heat. There is also transport. There's also industry. So where is the energy going? And what part is regulated? And what is storage doing in the whole thing? And to get a reliable energy supply, it requires storage of the energy sources directly or indirectly involved. For instance, you need gas storage and a good operating gas system to get a reliable power, power system. 
I think the example of Texas uh, two weeks ago showed clearly that the storage of gas, the availability of gas, is crucial for a reliable power system. So we cannot look at them independently. independently. What, are the, what are energy resources that can store a lot of energy? Petroleum and nuclear. If you fuel the nuclear reactor, it can operate for 18 months without just by the stored energy. And if you look at the grids, we see different energy grids, electricity and gas being regulated, heat networks being non-regulated. So the question is, should storage, as Lee's put it forward, be regulated, non-regulated, or whatever? What do we see now? Batteries can be behind the meter, and then they are not regulated. I have a home battery, so nobody is regulating that. But if it's utility scale, it may be a need for regulated assets, part of the regulated asset base of the TSOs, is nobody else wants to invest, or the DSOs. If we look in the future, we have electric vehicles. Electric vehicles stores an awful lot of energy. Just to give you an, ex an example, my electric car stores roughly, say, five or six times the amount of kilowatt hours that I need per day at home. So it's a big storage compared to what I'm using. A very inexpensive storage of electricity is a water heater. And there you store electricity as heat. Is that kind of storage being part of the regulated assets? Is that, is that storage? How are we going to look at it? Pumped hydro, the best known in town, but also these days, power to X, power to hydrogen, power to methane, or anything like that. And if you take it to power to methane, or you inject hydrogen into the natural gas, there is storage as part of the line pack, which is a regulated thing. But if it's used like feedstock, it's a market product. So what are we talking about? With natural gas, we have the storage in the line pack. We have LNG. We have underground cavities. And we have small-scale biogas, all being uh, regulated businesses. In Belgium, I know that. Heat networks, it's non-regulated. And heat storage is not regulated. So it can be implemented as seasonal storage for electricity PV. So again, something very weird. And now I come to a series of slides, which raises for me when I was walking around and thinking about preparing this lecture, which raises to me a question which I cannot solve. And I would like to discuss the next slides with you, to show them to you. And we, these are the real problems that our regulatory colleagues should take care of. If I have a generator supplied by natural gas and a demand and a battery, if we look at that system, which parts are market-based, which parts may be market-based or may be regulated in orange, or may or are regulated. We will see them step by step. We can do this, a similar exercise with four systems being energized by a wind generating unit, say an offshore wind park. Then we have an electrolyzer, and then we make hydrogen, and we use that hydrogen as such. Or we have hydrogen put in a fuel cell and supply electricity or we have an electrolyzer and add to that CO2, and we produce methane or methanol, and then have a demand. So in fact, what you do is you produce electricity, and at the end, you use it as an energy service. And you will see none of them is consistently regulated. Just a gas-fired power plant is supplied by a regulated pipeline. The generator is non-regulated, is competitive, and supplies either the demand or a battery via a regulated grid. The battery may be regulated, may be not regulated. Normally, it would be non-regulated. And then it supplies again the demand by a regulated grid. So you see you have here 
several times going back and forward between regulated and non-regulated. But this is the easy one. We understand this. Now, if we go to a wind generator and we supply via a regulated grid, an electrolyzer, and some of them are saying there, is, there are voices and we discussed that with Alberto in another seminar here, it may be that there is a need for regulated or starting to be regulated electrolyzers to get the system going. So the electrolyzer probably is in the market, but also may be in a, regu in a regulated business as a start. And then you come to the hydrogen grid, which is a private <clears throat> grid, which is the grid in Europe of Air Liquide. And you supply a hydrogen storage and you go into a gas demand. All non-regulated market-based elements. Now, if you do the same thing, and you go into the uh, into supplying from the wind generator electricity demand, you can do that either directly via the regulated grid, electricity <laughs> grid, or you supply with a regulated grid the electrolyzer, and via a non-regulated hydrogen grid, you come to a fuel cell, supplying back to electricity grid and supplying the demand. So you see a very weird thing. You have a you have an energy transmission system, which is partially regulated, partially non-regulated. Now, if we do the same thing, and we go from the electricity grid, and we go to we make from uh, electricity hydrogen, we combine that with CO two to produce e methane, which is e natural gas. That's of course not correct. It's e methane. You put that into the gas grid and you store it. Then you get a regulated storage, the methane storage, the natural gas storage. Totally different, same energy flow. Now, some people are saying that we need methanol as liquid fuels. And methanol is stored in a truck or a ship and then stored in a big container, which is now in a harbor or somewhere else. So it's a regulated, it's a non-regulated, it's a market-based storage here. So if you produce methane, you get a regulated storage. If you produce methanol, you get a market-based storage. And again, the system is totally the same. And to make things even more vague, you see that in the future, there is storage everywhere. If you see to the overall system, you see heat storage, you see storage in electric vehicles, you see heat storage, you see batteries, you see grid-based storage, utility-based storage. What are we going to regulate? Are you going to regulate a utility-scale battery, which is 10 times smaller than all the electric vehicles that are connected to the grid with the same, with the same type of storage being batteries? Mm -hmm. So really, for the future, it's totally unsure what we're going to regulate and how to regulate this because storage is everywhere in that advanced energy system, distributed energy system. Are we only going to regulate the central part of the storage or are we going to regulate the whole thing of the storage? Or as Lee said, are we not going to regulate anything? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Ronnie, for setting the scene. I'm sure um, there'll be uh, a lot of comments and questions um, that you have uh, provoked uh, in the audience. But I'd like to now turn to Carol uh, Leonard, um, and she is head of EU affairs um, at Store Energy, um, as well as um, being very active in GIE and has, having supervised a number of studies on the regulation of storage on behalf of GIE. So I'd like to welcome her to the debate. And Carol, the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, debate, FSR debate. As uh, a representative of GIE today, as uh, you mentioned, we have launched a study recently again on storage 
And I'm very happy today to, to, to share our, our recommendation on this study in a way we are still uh, wondering how we can manage the situation about you know, regulation of storage. So thank you very much. Um, I will start with this slide where I'm going to explain all the studies that have been carried out uh, within GIE over the, these last few years. Um, I will try to do it very quickly. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see the quantitative studies uh, that have been uh, carried out by GIE. And we have tried um, uh, to uh, make some sensitivity analysis on gas storage reduction to show um, exactly what could be the avoided cost in the system, for example, or in terms of insurance, because the problem, or let's say the challenge with storage, is that we are talking about externalities, and these externalities are not very easily to calculate. So we have to uh, do this kind of sensitivity analysis to internalize in a little this these values that are not easily to capture. Um, in 2018, we've done this collaboration with NSOC, uh, and we have tried to demonstrate that there is a risk of gas curtailment by 2030, as soon as we reduce storage uh, working gas volume by 10%. So imagine that in Europe, we reduce by 10% the capacity of gas storage, and there is already a risk when there will be a cold winter, if there is a cold winter. Um, um, in 2019, we have done the same exercise, but with Artelis, and based on the EPSOG and SWE assumption. And uh, we have done the same, but we have seen the impact for the electricity system. And we have been able to demonstrate first that there are additional operating costs as soon as we reduce the storage by 10%. And then the risk of electricity and containment as soon as we reduce the storage capacity by 20% by 2030. In addition to that, in addition to showing that the risk and the impact, we have been able to calculate the value of storage and showing that it's easy. We can calculate this value in terms of avoided electricity generation capacity cost, meaning that if we uh, reduce capacity in the storage, um, then we can show that we will have higher cost on the electricity side in terms of generation capacity cost and also but it was not calculated in that study in terms of investment in new electric lines. So the idea would be to explain that if later on we have to discuss this cost in a way we know that we are able to calculate it. In, in parallel to the studies on the, on the, for the qualitative studies, so it's on the uh, right hand side, we have made several studies with queries showing and explaining the gas storage market failures, uh, explaining that all the value is not captured by the market. Then we've made some studies also with FTI to work on the measures that could fit to the storage markets. And finally, we've worked uh, with Frontier and Beko both on the lessons that could be learned from the electricity market to see what could be the measures that we could propose at the, at the EU level. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna show only one slide from Frontier Baker Bot study, but you can find it on the GIE website. We have tried to make it clear that in addition to the market value, there are some avoided electricity costs that can be calculated and then discuss in the way we try later on to internalize them. That would have to talk later on about, for example, how we can help uh, electrification. <coughs> uh, we, and we introduce also some discussion around the system value and the insurance value. Um, so without going too far, because uh, um, there are a lot of things to say about this study, very important points, different measures that could be considered. I'm going to focus on the recommendation that has been made by GIE uh, on that study, the kind of measures that we would like to introduce later on, if it's possible, at EU level. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, again, if you don't mind, just two slides uh, of one more, if you don't mind. So I'm going to talk about the recommendation. So thank you very much. Um, 
we have tried, no, sorry, it was the right side before. No, sorry, the first one. So if you, uh, the slide before, and again, the slide before, in fact, that's, that's this one, sorry for that. The last, uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? I'm sorry, Carol. This is the fourth no. slide of, out of nine. Shall I move ahead to the fifth slide? So the three measures that are just uh, after this slide. Shall I move one slide ahead? So okay, this yes. is slide five. Yeah, thank you. This one. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we are, yes, yeah, this one, this, this one. Thank you very much. Sorry, it's my fault. Um, and um, so we have tried to see what could be the measures we would like to discuss later on with the commission. Uh, and we decided to discuss mostly the market-based cross-sectoral regulatory intervention. So the need for st the, of storage for the electricity system, for example, and to enhance energy system integration through the flexibility provided by gas storage. And the first thing we would like to discuss, so I will uh, I will explain later because I've got, I've got some slide on it, but I will discuss first the need to ensure better coordination in the network planning. We would like to be invited first, and then we would like to see how we can um, make it clear that sensitive analysis are very key to discuss the flexibility option. Uh, then we wanted to, to, to discuss uh, regulatory incentive in itself to avoid uh, the increasing electricity capacity cost in the system. And finally, we, we wanted to say a few words about the government intervention in case of the residual cost storage market failures, meaning that even if we introduce market additional market uh, based reform, there's a risk in terms of security of supply. And in that case, the residual market failures need to be, in a way, uh, 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 discussed at a national level, at the national level, to find a, a solution to ensure the adequacy which is required in terms of storage capacity. So thank you very much. I'm going to move on the first, uh, on the next slide to discuss the first point. The thank you very much. So the the net. Better, net, better coordinated network planning. So the idea would be, uh, as we are storage operator, and we know that we are talking about externalities, externalities related to the avoided cost in terms of generation, in terms of transmission line. Um, we thought that it would be very important that now, as part of this coordination, we introduce the assessment of the avoided capacity cost. Uh, operational and investment in a way we enable to avoid unnecessary uh, capacity cost in the system. In a way, we can talk about optimization and about decarbonization by introducing this externality. Uh, the main benefits are well known unnecessary investment and any risk of security of supply, because in case of a very cold winter, strong cold winter. At the end, we know that storage is gas storage is the only kind of asset that can provide the capacity which is required in the system. Um, um, this is it. So if, if we move to the next uh, slide, uh, that's also a very important point. So if you look at the uh, right hand side, you see the electricity system, you see the power output. And you know that in the electricity system, they talk about CRM in a way they try to see how the CRM can remunerate uh, the, the, the capacity from power plant as such as gas fire power plant to, uh, in case of <laughs> that for providing the capacity which is required. We want to make it clear that uh, the, the focus from an electricity system perspective should be enlarged to integrate the full and whole value chain. Even if at the end we are talking about the electricity usage by understanding that there is one gas storage asset that enable to secure the fuel supply. Meaning that if you have the power plant that have, that have been remunerated 
And at the end, at the last moment for cold winter, they are not able to run because storage has not been able to pick, to secure the fuel supply. At the end, and even if you, if you have this remuneration of the capacity for being available, there is a risk that coal power plant may be run instead of gas power plant. And in the future, you may have the same, the same, um, the same understanding uh, because today it's only with gas, but in the future it may be with zero carbon energy from renewable. So more or less, the idea would be to see the link between the capacity that is being provided by the gas system as a whole to secure the fuel supply for the electricity system as a final end user market. And I see that I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go do very quick for the last slide. So in case there is still um, uh, residual gas storage market failures, meaning that we haven't been able up to know to find a way we can remunerate the capacity for the service provided. And knowing that there is some cost related to this gas storage capacity, it may happen that in some countries for some reason, government interventions still need to be required as a further measures to secure a reliable energy supply, knowing that we are going to, uh, we have going to face uh, the removal of most, uh, of the phase out of most fossil fuel power plant. And in a dynamic regulation, there's still a need to have this adequacy of supply. And that is adequacy, if it's to find a way we can have this massive electrification at the end, finding a way that the gas consumer are not the, the only one who pays. So there is also a question around the adequacy of supply and we'll, who will be the one who will have to support this kind of uh, uh, remuneration. So thank you very much. Um, I hope it was clear enough. Thank you. I can't hear you, Lee. Sorry. Thank you. I didn't, I thought I was, I'd unmuted myself, but not quite. So thank you very much. It was extremely clear. And again, thank you for putting um, a lot of, flagging up a lot of important questions. Um, I think now uh, we turn immediately to the panel um, and Alberto will, I think in, you will introduce <coughs> the panel to us, Alberto. Yes, thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Ronnie, as well. Um, very interesting introductory presentations. Now we have a panel with uh, three panelists. We have Guido Cervinia from DFC Economics. We have uh, Doug Wood from EFED, and we have Benoit Esno from, um, from uh, uh, CRE, the, the French regulator, but also um, the um, Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulator. So um, we, I would suggest that we do a first round of introductory remarks. Um, as I said, if we could stay within five minutes, then we run polls and then you will have the opportunity also to comment on the outcome of the poll and also what the others in the panel have uh, have said so far. So um, Guido, if you want to go first. Uh, thank you, Alberto, and thank you, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay, I hope, uh, is it working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Um, well, funnily enough, I seem to be the only one who doesn't see it. Uh, okay, so my, my first remark uh, builds uh, on uh, Ronnie's uh, um, uh, speech. And uh, it basically confirms that there are many alternative ways to store uh, energy. And some of those ways are uh, upstream of the meters, uh, of the final user meters. Uh, some of those uh, uh, ways to uh, store uh, energy are behind the meters, and they compete against each other. Uh, they, get compete, they compete against each other, and they're subject to different regulatory regimes. But that's, uh, I mean, uh, so far so good, that's Ronnie. Uh, let me add uh, uh, an another dimension of complexity. And the other dimension is that uh, all these uh, uh, ways to store uh, uh, energy uh, do compete also with a sort of genuine uh, consumer side flexibility that we hope to see uh, increasing soon. And that it is, by the way, regulated in that uh, it is supported uh, uh, in various ways in different countries. And uh, there is also a, a, another dimension of complexity that I would like to add uh, to what Ronnie said, 
And is that uh, flexibility on the consumer side, storage, as we saw, uh, all compete against capacity, production capacity. Uh, in, in, in electricity, it is evident because capacity is an immediate substitute of storage <clears throat> and flexibility. And that capacity also is regulated because it's a subject to uh, different measures uh, to support it, uh, capacity remuneration systems. So th this is just to say that uh, achieving regulatory uh, neutrality is going to be uh, more and more challenging uh, if it is not already challenging enough. Now, a second thing that I, uh, that I uh, stole from, uh, uh, from Ronnie is the title that I changed a bit. It is true that, uh, uh, that uh, storage is everywhere, but also distortions are, are everywhere. They could hide everywhere. Uh, first of all, in tariffs, uh, you can have uh, transportation tariff distortions uh, that prevent efficient huge, uh, use and development of storage capacity. Uh, you can have uh, uh, taxes or uh, tariff components that are similar to taxes that prevent the development of storage capacity or bias the use of capacity. And finally, uh, you can have distortions uh, in, in the area of uh, uh, price volatility. Here I'm thinking electricity more than, uh, than anything else. But if you don't have uh, uh, the right pricing for the commodity, uh, you're likely to have uh, uh, wrong decisions uh, in terms of uh, use and development of uh, capacity, uh, production capacity, and the storage and also demand flexibility. So uh, a lot of complex things for regulators to handle. Now, my other remark is on uh, is a, a bit of uh, advertising, and this is a remark on tariffs, the aggression of tariffs. Uh, the Florence School of Regulation has done a lot of work on that. Uh, we have uh, two papers out, uh, uh, both very recent, on uh, optimal tarification of gas infrastructures. And from there, I, I just like to recall uh, um, three messages. The first of all, uh, the first one is that the per megawatt tariff, per megawatt hour tariffs uh, that are supposed to cover fixed costs are common practice in electricity industries. Uh, there are common practices in uh, monopolies in general, but they are sort of all right when they are applied to final consumers. They are less than all right when they are applied to buyers uh, whose demand is more flexible. And typically this is shippers or energy suppliers. Uh, these guys have choices. Uh, they can move from one solution to another to meet the final customer's needs. And so making wrong tariffs there uh, can cause uh, uh, material distortions. The other message that we got is that uh, store storage decisions are affected by many things, transmission tariffs, uh, and product design, uh, security of system obligations on the gas side, security of system obligations on the, on the electricity generation side. Uh, that is to say that tarification issues uh, should, uh, <coughs> and more and more actually, uh, be addressed uh, holistically across industries and uh, across uh, different bits of the value chain. And the third and last message uh, it's uh, on the relationship between uh, gas infrastructures and uh, uh, electricity security of supply. And uh, there, what we found is, uh, or at least this is our current uh, thinking, is that uh, uh, gas infrastructures do contribute to electricity security of supply, but they do it via the services they sell to generators. So in a sense, uh, uh, if one gets those, the prices of those services right, there should be no, any, uh, no externality left uh, to internalize uh, with other measures. Um, then uh, uh, finally, uh, sort of two warnings for, uh, for regulators. The first one is that uh, making load flexible, I mean, re extracting real uh, consumer side flexibility, that is a substitute for storage and the capacity, requires interacting with final consumers and requires being very creative because it requires uh, handling the consumer's equipment. And the, the recommendation here, the warning here for regulators is uh, be aware that planning is a very, very poor substitute for markets uh, when it comes to delivering creative solutions. And, and the solutions that you need to extract flexibility from consumers are indeed uh, creative and decentralized solutions. So uh, in a sense, uh, uh, don't think that planning can can be as good as markets in, this, in that area. The second recommendation is uh, 
again on uh, intertemporal price differences of the commodity uh, that are the main driver of, of storage decisions and development. Uh, again, uh, you can indeed support the development of uh, flexibility or uh, genuine uh, demand side response uh, by putting money, I mean, by, by subsidizing people. You can definitely do that, but that's not a great substitute uh, for genuine price volatility. So in a sense, uh, do not rely on, uh, on uh, uh, support if uh, the environment uh, and the, the overall market design is not, uh, uh, is not friendly to flexibility and to storage. Or, and that, that's it on my side. Those are my remarks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, I think also interesting observations, uh, more to discuss later on. Um, and thank you also for a bit of marketing of um, the FSR report. Uh, Doug, uh, Doug Wood, Ifet, Doug, you're next. Please, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Guido as well for giving a, giving a good um, talk to Marcus as well. Sorry, I'll put my... Uh... Get my phone back uh, for, for giving a good introduction to the role of Marcus. If I can ask for a slide, my slide to be uh, to put, be put up, please. Um, because when I was looking at this, I was very interested to see. Uh, can everyone else see the slide? I can't see the slide. No, I can't. Um, Chiara, can you put Chiara? the slides up, please? <coughs> While we're finding it, I was interested to consider how fungible different types of storage. Um, Ah, to what extent, if one of the problems is, you know, to what extent we can use uh, gas storage types to provide a service into the electricity and, and vice versa, you know, what are the constraints and limitations on that? Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and so we, we've now got three vectors. We used to have two, electricity and natural gas, and maybe one day we'll have two, electricity and hydrogen. But for some considerable time, we are likely to see during a transition phase, electricity, hydrogen, natural gas. And I, I realize this is this is a simplification. I have ignored methanol, I've ignored biogas and biomethane and so on. So let's just restrict this to the, uh, uh, to the three we see here. Now, um, and you'll see, importantly, you get two direction arrows between electricity and hydrogen. You can convert electricity to hydrogen and therefore link electricity storage with hydrogen storage and vice versa and between natural gas and hydrogen. But interestingly, really economically, you only move in one direction between natural gas and electricity and not in the other direction. So if you wanted to store electricity in natural gas, as natural gas, you have to pass through an additional vector. And there are, there are additional regulations and costs and barriers in, in terms of doing that. And I'll come back to that later. So what, we, what we've got to do is remember in trading terms, storage is merely a combination of a put option and a call option. Um, for each of the vectors. So what we call injection and in gas or battery charging or pushing water up a hill, it competes with other put options of increasing demand and reducing supply. Uh, and withdrawal competes with other call options, which is reducing demand and increasing supply. Um, so these are already competing in multiple markets um, if you break it down into those two constituent parts. So what else does storage do? Well, okay, it allows network operators to balance the system and, you know, and it provides a transportation substitute, as we know. There's also in gas, there's important elements of providing orderly rundown of the system for security and in illiquid markets, operating and balancing margins that help the TSO balance the system when there isn't a liquid balancing market. And for network users, it helps them balance their own supply and demand in their own portfolio, yes. Um, in liquid markets, it can help provide some kind of temporal arbitrage um, and ability to hedge prices. But in low liquidity markets, and remember, hydrogen will be low liquidity for some time, so it may be very important there. It provides a substitute for that low liquidity. If the market's not there when I need it to be, I can always take some storage and I can rely on that. And it provides me with some insurance and backup. And of course, the other significant um, role of storage is to provide peak energy supply. And is this an economic way to provide additional peak supply, which it has historically been in gas, but less so in power? Uh, there's another missing element here, which is blending, uh, because currently burners require a constant proportion of hydrogen and methane in blended systems. Now, if, if we get beyond that, so we can have dynamic adjustment or separation technology through advanced membranes, then you have much more fungibility between natural gas and hydrogen storage. But at the beginning, that's, that's pretty unlikely. Now, 
two things I want to draw your attention towards uh, specifically in this in this diagram. So the first is in a world of increased penetration of intermittent renewable ele electricity, there's two potentially competing technologies. You can try to address that in the electricity system through through batteries, um, uh, and electricity or other forms of electricity storage, or you can electrolyze that and store it in the uh, store it as hydrogen or or another vector or or in the use of line packs. So we've got different models here. So if you have a situation where you have private investment in batteries, but you have a regulated environment in electrolysis and line pack, then you're, ha you're creating barriers to private investment in that. So you're creating a very tilted playing field where one means takes a lot of the risk away and the other is fully exposed. So that's one specific area I think is important to, to look at and how that impacts markets. The other one I would draw attention to is the assumption that we make that, and, and Sear makes this in, it, in this recent report in storage, that it kind of says, well, there's loads of gas storage around and things like depleted fields, so we don't need to worry about hydrogen. Now, I've been looking for a lot of research, and here's an advert to anyone who's out there. If, you, if you've been doing research on what happens if you inject hydrogen into a depleted gas field, do please get in touch, because the more I read about this, there are a lot of... Um, difficulties or challenges in doing this, um, which we would need to iron out. And if you take away seasonal storage from hydrogen, if it's a lot more expensive or technically more difficult, then in order to store seasonally or the challenges in seasonal storage of electricity are significantly greater. And this comes back to one of the points that Guido made as well, that um, if, if it becomes extremely expensive that you're talking about going through two vectors or investing in ele seasonal electricity storage, which looks very uneconomic at the moment, then the level of scarcity pricing that you might need to incentivize that may be extreme. And there's a question of whether regulators and authorities are prepared to permit that level of scarcity pricing uh, in order to uh, allow commercial solutions like this to develop. Um, so there's a question there that might be worth coming back to. Um, but just a, a, a couple of sum, summary remarks. You cannot consider storage in isolation. It's competing in other directors. Um, a common regulatory framework for electricity storage, methane storage, hydrogen storage may not be achievable. And we have to have further technical research in order to, um, uh, to be able to understand some of these, some of these issues more. And I've run a little over time, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and save the rest for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, thank you also for putting uh, the different uh, options uh, on, a, on a single um, chart, which is uh, very nice uh, as a summary. Uh, yes, indeed, there are many things that we will discuss. There are also a few questions coming in exactly along the lines that you have been discussing. Uh, Benoit, um, what's your take? Yeah, thank you. So I have no slide to, to present. And as Lee said, uh, actually, there are many probably more questions than answers at this stage. So my, my point will be um, to try to, to give some lines of reflection on what, it, <coughs> what regulation is about. And so the, the different uh, presentations uh, today show how complex this topic is and the importance to try as much as possible to have a systemic vision. I mean, to, to understand how the different elements interact <laughs> within the energy systems. For Of course, it's, it's very challenging because we are in a changing world. So it's very difficult to, to know what, what will be the outcome of uh, all these developments. And it's particularly complex for, for regulators because we have to think about what would be the proper design of the system. We see that different actors have some, some points to make and say, okay, this is my orientation. This is another one. In the end, we need to make some decisions and say, okay, this is uh, the orientation we, we may propose. And I would start by saying that the role of regulation is not to be opposed to the market, but really the way it is uh, practiced, I hope, well, at least in Europe is, that regulation is there to facilitate the market to develop. So as a starting point, I'd say that in these developments, there is a kind of technological neutrality on the side of regulators to say, we are not there to promote uh, an option against another. Uh, and here I would 
tell Guido and, and also Doug that we agree that when innovation is at stake, uh, probably the market is better, is more efficient than, than planning. But the question that comes afterwards is, what is necessary for innovation to happen? And what is the role of infrastructure? And this is the core question. Um, infrastructure uh, with these big systems, uh, with the huge consumption of energy, play a fundamental role because they, they bridge all the, all the sectors. They bridge electricity, gas, consumers, producers, and so on. So we cannot act as if they did not play uh, such a role. Then the question is, we have this importance of infrastructure and uh, two questions, when regulate and how regulate? Where, where should we, uh, why should we regulate? And that brings me to, to uh, some kind of economic developments. I mean, and there's been a lot of research, especially within FSR, um, about these con this concept, for example, of essential facility. Here we're touching upon a kind of market failure and to say in a system, do we see some elements in the value chains where we need to organize, let's say, to, to make it collective, organize an access to players, to various players, because this infrastructure will play a role of support to, to the other activities. If activities are easily contestable, probably they're not part of the essential facilities. And that's to me the challenge we have here. We can learn a lot from, from the developments in the uh, gas sector, but probably the picture was a little bit more easy to address because it's clear that seasonal storage in the gas sector is absolutely necessary. Let me talk about France, for in France there is no doubt we need a lot of storage and users have to use the existing facilities. This activity is not purely contestable. But with the development of flexibility sources, this question of contestability uh, has taken more, more and more importance. That brings me to a, another element in terms of regulation. And here gas storage, once again, <clears throat> is very interesting. We have two different values and, and, and here the, the question of value is fundamental. Individual value for market players. And, and, and Guido mentioned this, uh, uh, these prices, the intertemporal prices differences. That's a critical point in, in this, in the individual value. But beyond that, uh, there's a question of externalities, briefly uh, mentioned by, by Carol as well, and how to address the externality that in an, uh, an energy system on a network, um, any individual decision has an effect on the overall functioning of the system. And here we're talking about systemic value. For example, if market players fail storing gas, what should we do to ensure security of supply? Now, it's more a question for a gas sector, but that could be a question on, in other sectors, in a hydrogen potentially, in electricity, because with intermittence, this big question of what can we do with surpluses when we have a deficit? And that's the critical question. We don't have the answers yet, but I think we can build on the, uh, the current practice. Not to be, to be too long. I would say that nowadays in the uh, regulator's reflection, um, I would say we have, let's say, a first topic, which is technology. What would be the relevant technologies to be promoted? Is there a need for a support or not? The second topic is about the business models. Business models that lead also to the market designs. How to understand the behavior and the expectations of market players and where we need, we need to foster some potentialities to, to, to make innovation on all aspects uh, occur. And the third aspect I'd like to insist on is investment. Planning is not necessarily always the solution, but we see that we need to uh, re-include this storage aspect within the overall network planning and infrastructure planning. Where should we locate in these, these, uh, these storage facilities? In hydrogen, there is a very interesting point, which is not, only, uh, not exactly about storage, but where should we locate electrolyzers, for example, near electricity sources, near consumers? You see, there is a very important debate. I, I don't think there, there is any stable answer to that yet. So I would close that here, my speech here, mainly to raise these important questions that we have nowadays and repeating that the purpose of regulation is to help the market and not to compete with the market. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Benoit. Yes, indeed, regulation is a pure substitute for the market, so it shouldn't compete. It should only come in when the market cannot uh, function. And I think we might have a few cases um, here. Um, so thanks a lot. Thank you for the three panelists for their introductory remarks. We now, uh, Chiara, if we can start with the polls um, and we can have the, fir the first poll up. Excellent, thank you very much. So the, the, the first one is about the uh, definition of what we, um, we, 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 we usually refer to as level playing field. Uh, does it mean that all energy routes between the same primary energy source and the same final consumption type should be subject to the same network charging? So whichever route you take, you pay the same. Should it mean that um, each energy route should be subject to cost-reflective network charging, or should it, each stage in each energy route should be should have a cost-reflective, non-discriminatory network charging based on common charging principles, or the final one, D, um, if you have no views, please choose D. So if you could start voting, uh, I'm sorry, panelists would not be able to vote, but uh, everybody else, and we had some stage more than 170 participants connected, uh, please, please vote. So A, the same charge for every, for, for, for every route, for all the routes. The second one is uh, consistent at the route level, um, cost reflective. The third one is at each stage, again, cost reflective, non-discriminatory, but based on common principles. Chiara, once you're ready. Right, uh, so there seems to be a large majority for, for, for option C, which is basically looking at um, having a non-discriminatory cost-reflective charging for each stage. So each stage of each route should be looked in isolation. So rather than being looking at the route as a whole. Um, that's, I think, something interesting to, to, to comment later on. Um, second, uh, second poll, uh, Kara, again, if you could show it. How can we ensure? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How can we? How can we ensure that um, a playing a level playing field is? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm lost the screen for a moment. I'm good. That a level playing field is maintained between the different energy routes, and that no discrimination occurs. Um, vote um, vote for A if you think that this needs detailed legislation at EU level. Uh, vote B if you think that uh, guidance is enough in the form of general principles. Vote C um, if you have not yet made your mind. So this is a simpler alternative. Um, simpler alternatives, um, please vote. So A, detailed rules, rules at uh, EU level. B, guidance is enough. Uh, general principles. Um, okay, so we have now the results. Oh, well, we seem to have quite almost uh, uh, equal um, responses, slightly more for, for detailed rules, but um, this is probably one of the closest uh, answers we ever had on, on, on polls in this uh, de de debate series. So thank you very much. Uh, again, um, next question. Um, it's the third poll. For some reason, I'm, I'm losing this screen quite often. Okay, let me. Um, sorry, here I, I now re regain this. Okay, should story be considered a withdrawal from the network and a subsequent injection into the network and charge accordingly? So, um, is this what storage is about? Um, a withdrawal and an injection. Um, if you think that this is the case, uh, please uh, vote yes. If you think that this is not the case since storage does not consume, strictly speaking, or produce, strictly speaking, energy, so B. And C, it depends on the type and the role of storage. So there are no um, general rules. You have to see what storage is about. And again, D, uh, if you have no views on the matter, or oh, we already have the results. Okay, so that's... Um, it seems that the majority, again, quite, quite a neat majority, uh, believes that storage should be treated differently depending on the type and, and, and role. 
So thank you very much. Um, I think quite interesting signals, quite interesting input uh, for our panelists. So I would like um, the panelists now, if they can comment briefly, maybe no more than two or three minutes each at the most um, on um, on what the you know what the audience has uh, indicated. That if you can stay within two or three minutes, then we have also uh, some time for. Um, questions later on. Uh, Carol and, 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 and Ronnie, also, if you want to step in, please um, do it um, um, after the, the, the panel. So I would go back again to Guido, Doug and, and Benoit, and then uh, Carol and Ronnie. Guido. OK, um, I just have a comment on the first poll. And uh, the comment is uh, um, uh, that uh, cost reflectiveness, uh, that seems to be the sort of driving force uh, uh, behind what the majority uh, said. Cost reflectiveness uh, is, a, is a tricky concept uh, in, in industries in which uh, most of the costs are fixed and sunk. And so uh, assessing the responsibility of a single customer to causing the cost is, different, is difficult. I mean, economic theory has a lot to say on that. It's uh, sort of very consolidated results. Uh, they call it peak load pricing. And the idea is that uh, an optimal cost reflective price is zero when the network is not full or the infrastructure is not fully used. And it's very, very high, uh, the price that uh, convinces demand to go down to capacity when the infrastructure is fully used. Uh, that again uh, boils down to, to price volatility because these are extreme, extreme forms of pricing. So, in a sense, uh, what everyone, uh, what most of the people, uh, seem to want is a, is, a, is a pricing mechanism that is very conducive of volatility, possibly difficult to implement, but definitely very new compared to what we are used to. So that's my, that's all I have to say on the polls, actually. Thank you very much, Guido, for raising this, uh, this dimension. Uh, Doug? Uh, yes, again, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking along similar lines, but from a different viewpoint. Um, when I saw that, that was certainly was 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 my vote if, if I had been allowed to answer the question, because if, if we're dealing with normal running balancing of systems as distinct from 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 the peak loading, as I as I tried to tease out the two different things in my initial remarks, then there are uh, multiple ways of addressing these uh, system balancing and flexibility issues. And, and and some of these have the this is where the, the traded market actually is good at developing virtual storage facilities and uh, that can substitute for many of these things or combine the different physical types of storage from demand side. And if you if you start to com combine or or, or 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 have something that is not cost reflective of the individual stages in between. Then it's uh, then it could be distortive in terms of the the, the services that you're you, you're able to provide. So that's something that we you know definitely would would would, would support there. I, I also had some sympathy with the um, treatment of of, of, of storage um, withdrawal and injection and whether that was that was um, dependent on uh, the type of storage and that that's certainly where we've got to to date. And, and many of the discussions on the on, on the gas side about you know whether it's imposing an additional load on the system, whether it's it's failing to gain some uh, locational benefit that it probably deserves as a transportation substitute, and these these have led to kind of solutions within what is possible. So, um, and some of these are, are would unnecessarily complicate to move away. So I, again, I'd, I'd be supportive in a in a horses for courses environment that allows us to recognise different pros and cons of, of, of what storage is delivering and, and, and that also. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you, Doug. Benoit, I mean, this is uh, regulatory turf, right? <laughs> Charging yes, for, yes. for things, uh, so. Yeah, Alberto, and, and you remember these never ending debates we had on the network code on tariffs in, in gas some years ago, and which showed that cost reflectivity is a very interesting starting point, but actually when we have to translate it Concretely, uh, um, this is where the, the, uh, the, the uh, issues start and the problems <coughs> start, sorry. So I'd say that in a, in a first, <coughs> first approach, cost reflectivity, of course, is good because if it's possible and relevant, then it's a very easy way of, 
dividing costs between, between users. But the fact is that more than ever, probably, we have to look at synergies between different sectors. And, and sometimes cost reflectivity is not a, a enough and, and not usable. So I, my general perspective is to say, uh, first, it's better probably to try as much as possible to have a global perspective on the system. Uh, that, that's challenging, but it's uh, to, to see if you move something on one, uh, on one element, probably you could have some consequences on others. Though, so ideally we should be aware of, uh, of these elements. Um, this, the second topic is, um, it's interesting this, this answer on, on cost reflectivity, because when we look at tariff aspects, uh, there, there are some comments on distortions that could be introduced due to tariffs and sometimes cost reflective tariffs could introduce some distortions. Um, so we have to, to find a proper balance between cost value. I, I know I, I'm very general and, and developing on, on concepts, but uh, at this stage, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very important. So that brings me to a, a short comment on the, um, the question of uh, detailed legislation versus uh, general principles. To me, uh, I would not oppose these, uh, these different um, uh, orientations. For sure, we need to have some guidance and general principles are crucial. Then the question is, at, some point in, uh, at a point in time on some topics, we need to get into the details of the legislation to give security to users and especially to guarantee uh, one point, which is non-discrimination, which is absolutely critical in, in our systems. So I would see here uh, for this second, this second poll, I would say we have to combine uh, in a smart way, uh, these general principles and uh, some detailed uh, elements of uh, legislation. Thank you very much, um, Carol and, and Ronnie. I think, um, and maybe you know, also the others later on. One of the one of the questions, one of the polls, uh, return uh, quite a preference for a, a um, an approach which would depend, in terms of charging, on the types of uh, types and role of storage. So I'm wondering what different types and roles would be relevant when it comes to to, to charging. Um, I don't know, Carol, you want to go first and then Ronnie will, you can comment on any of the outcome or, or, or on this specific aspect, because this was not picked up by the three panelists so far. I can start, yeah? Yep, please. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I, you're right. I think it's a question of the different kind of storage assets you may have in the future. Uh, knowing that we still have to secure the supply uh, for the energy system as a whole, as has been said by Benoit also and the other, particip uh, other panelists. I, I believe that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, technological neutrality, in, in reality, there is uh, at least regarding the insurance value that the, 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 the idea that there is no substitute uh, of, for storage when we talk about the very cold winter. So at least everything is not substitute. And, and at least for that kind of services, we need to have a, a, a complete uh, overview of the system uh, to understand that all consumers are the beneficiaries of this kind of services. So for sure that there are some market values that can be uh, considered for the market where the traders and the others can compete for a normal winter and there are other questions regarding uh, the peak supply, peak demand. And, and for that point, I would say that up to now we are talking a lot about uh, the intermittency, the development, the high deployment of renewable, but we are still looking at uh, the supply side and the default of gas on the supply side. One day, we will see that the question will be about the demand and the fact that with uh, massive electrification, we will have this higher peak demand. And when, when we have to look at this higher variation of demand in a way we don't have substitute to storage, we still have to uh, put into question the need to look at the system as a whole to provide uh, the full uh, services that we can provide with the transmission system operator 
and the um, LNG terminal operators because we are more in the, as, as a complement that substitute uh, in the infrastructure. And for the future, they may have some storage connected to the hydrogen backbone. So for sure, they will need to understand the role of this gas uh, hydrogen storage in the future to, 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 to provide the services related to the backbone. But there will be also new business model. And for this new business model, um, there, there's, there are a lot of questions. For example, the business model connected to the grid gas grid, not connected at all, providing something at a local level in a circular way, or also imagine that some storage could be connected to the electricity grid, while still uh, providing the, 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 the large scale uh, storage that could be required in the electricity system. So it's going to be even uh, more challenging in the future to discuss this topic, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Ronnie. What do you that, take of the, that question, that answer? It depends. It, it, it depends. <laughs> that's a good, that, okay, that, that's all it depends. That was my answer. No, no, let's be, let's be clear. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back though. So if you look at the electricity system and then the arrows that I showed in the beginning, we are too much always thinking about the real time balance. We are thinking about that all kind of stuff. But we have to think energy-wise, and also if we look at the future, we have more electrification, and people are saying this will put an enormous, an enormous burden on the electricity system to get the electricity system in balance. And I think it's reverse. Okay, the bigger the electricity supply becomes as the energy vector, the more it becomes stable. I explain in myself, if we if we have a 20 or 25 percent more electricity demand because of electric vehicles those things are by virtue very flexible in demand in fact they are storing and demand flexibility is often a, a, a storage in disguise okay if you have a heat pump with the heat storage it's not a flexible load it's a storage in disguise because there is a heat storage so we have to have a, a good thinking. And then you come to what Carol is saying, the, the seasonal storage. Okay, but if in future, so that was one point, that the, 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 the more electricity may, be, may have less problems with storage than the thin electricity system that we have now, because the, the loads that are adding to it are rather decent loads. Other side of the coin, long-term storage. We are used to that. We have all European countries have 90 days of petroleum storage because of the good old days of the friendly Arabs who did not provide petroleum in the 70s. Okay. Now, even future, if I look at the European uh, politics, like in Germany, etc., where we will import hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives like ammonia, etc., from abroad. We probably will have that kind of storage for 90 days on those e-fuels. And then the Dunkelflaute, which is called as a major problem for a twisty system, becomes negligible. Because if we have 90 days storage, a Dunkelflaute of one week, I don't care. So it's really a very interesting, intriguing way that we are looking at. And we are getting back to a system where we have long-term probably liquid high density energy storage, which will be E and hydrogen based at some point in, in the production process, and a much more stable, intrinsically say, stable with, with internal storage in the demand electricity system. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie, indeed, very interesting. Uh, Lee, uh, I, I'm wondering whether you want to, to come in with your reflection, because later on I would like to pick up on the excuse of one question which I will read, uh, because I think one, a long one that we had beforehand we already addressed, but one question about the, the value of, of, of storage or different options. But Lee, do you, do, do you have um, views on what uh, we got back from, uh, from the audience and uh, in general what our panelists have come up with? 
Lee? Uh, we cannot hear you, and I'm not sure we can see you either. Chiara, do you see Lee? Um, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll go ahead with my well, question, and if Lee reappears, then she could um, comment on. Uh, there was... Um, there was a question uh, among uh, a few. Um, can we give a value to the security supply through a capacity market that's sending the proper economic signal to storage? Um, and I would like to complement this with, uh, um, with, with, with another reflection. Here we are talking about, and it's about a bit of provocation, so take it as such. Um, here we're talking about charging and a level playing field between different um, between different storages opportunities. Um, now, uh, and we've, we've, we, are, we are sort of bouncing between costs that we cannot allocate and value that might be a reference uh, for, for, setting, uh, for setting the charging. Uh, but then if we think, you know, in the, in the old days where the only tariff that had to be come up with uh, was the tariff for final consumers, and if we were if if we were today to look at value, we would charge all final consumers at vol because that's the value of their, you know, for them of consumption. So if we wanted to, and this is obviously not not on, uh, because it would mean extracting, uh, you know, all the all the uh, consumer surplus, uh, uh, and you know, tariff tarification has never been done in this way. So. Um, Perhaps, you know, um, I don't know who among the panelists want to answer this question, this specific question, whether we can give a value to the security supply through a capacity market and thus sending the proper economic signal to storage that was more on, on a market base. And also whether by looking at value, opportunity, um, value, opportunity cost of doing, you know, alternative uh, solutions to storage, we maybe missing the point of what tarification should be about. Um, this, I think, would be for Benoit. I think yes, no, in, it's in, in, inevitably, but... Uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting question, a very complex one. Well, the, the, the question is, is good. Well, the answer may not be. Um, no, just to say, let's be careful because giving a value to security of supply, you know, it's very complex. And often the way it's been addressed both in electricity or gas, it's we look at the level of security we want to reach collectively. And according to the cost, then we find a key for splitting these costs, being through any mechanism. And capacity mechanisms often are just there to, to, to ensure that in the end, we have a certain amount of megawatts of generation capacity. So the point is then we can have auctions and so on. But in the end, what we want to reach is a technical target. Um, that's the same for storage. Storage has been a long debate, for example, on storage obligations, on, on um, uh, um, let's say, uh, strategic storages. And there's always been this question about, can we bring a proper uh, economic signal? And the question is then, uh, yeah, but what kind of signal? Are we talking about a very short of signal? Let's withdraw now because it's interesting there is a need uh, prices are high. Is, is it about the seasonal difference? You have a, you are incentivized by some expectations to store energy at a point in time to withdraw if lucky in the end. Um, so you see, in the end, to me, the, the, the first question to answer is, what is the role of the system, which is of a collective nature, and what is of an individual nature? If we are to say, each one is responsible for its own continuity of supply. We say, we don't need to regulate anything. If there is a blackout, no problem. It's because it's been a choice and consumers had to get, have batteries at home. So, you know, to me, the real question is, what is the level of security we want to give to, to the citizens? Then there, is, there are economic calculations behind, of course. And when we have determined this level, then what are the, the, the appropriate tools? which can be uh, capacity markets or other kinds of, of solutions. Sorry, I'm, I'm quite long. So. Thank you, Benoit. Um, anybody else wanted to come into this? I also have another couple of questions uh, to ask, but uh, if somebody 
wants to comment on this value versus cost dilemma for tariff setting. If I, if I might make a couple of just a couple of remarks on that, please, Alberto. I mean, it one is, is I, I, I am. I, I, I am surprised at the confidence in capacity markets, which have not been a resounding success, particularly in terms of the way they have been implemented in very different ways across the EU with different national priorities, which have which have distorted cross-border trade. So um, we, uh, capacity, market, capacity mechanisms and capacity markets are not something I would necessarily hold up as a resounding success to be applied everywhere. Uh, the second thing is, what, what is quite interesting is we are now on the argument of the, the third leg of the trilemma. We spent a long time arguing about affordability versus security and whether you know markets delivered security. Or, and then more recently, we have moved on to the, 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 the leg that says um, affordability versus sustainability and how do we, you know, how do markets operate within the within the Green Deal framework. Mm -hmm. if, if what we are seeking to do is remove fossil fuels entirely so that we are moving away from um, the traditional dispatchable plant that has provided the seasonality to the electricity industry. Um, th there's a question of what, what is left for a capacity mechanism to apply to. Um, and I think we're, we're putting a, a, a very heavy emphasis within current technologies on, on the hydrogen, dispatchable hydrogen plant. Um, and uh, uh, there's, if, if we electrify some highly seasonal um, uh, demand, such as a lot more heating than is it personally, and we not and we lose LNG and the existing production flexibility and import flexibility in gas. There is a a much larger amount of seasonality that needs to be replaced than than has been suggested uh, elsewhere in the debate. So that, I think there there are serious crunch points here, um, and that's why I say if we're going to rely on scarcity pricing to 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 drive those investment decisions, um, that. Uh, you know, some idea of how far that has to go, you know, would be would be an interesting piece of work. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Guido, I have one question for you um, coming from, from, from the audience. Um, uh, what, what do you think are the main regulatory barriers to aggregating the behind the meter storage to provide flexibility to uh, the electricity system besides the, um, the carb price volatility to which you refer? Um, yes, I mean, th there are, uh, for sure, in, every, in each country, there are uh, sort of uh, regulatory uh, uh, details uh, that might prevent this from happening. But there is one major, uh, at least possible, uh, source of uh, frictions, uh, and that is to do uh, precisely with capacity remuneration mechanisms uh, in electricity, some capacity remuneration mechanisms in electricity. Uh, basically, if uh, uh, the regulator decides, uh, and that's not only to do with the, si with the size of the capacity, but also with the choice of the mechanism. But generally speaking, if the regulator decides that the right amount of security or the right amount of capacity is a lot, then uh, you, you will not see price volatility in, po in spot markets. And if you don't see price volatility in, in spot markets, uh, the incentives to develop flexibility uh, sort of are not there. Then uh, a regulator might say, well, uh, in a sense, I've got another tool in my toolbox, and it is subsidies. I can sort of uh, subsidize uh, demand side, uh, for example, response or other measures for flexibility, and that will be all good. So I can wait until this flexibility subsidized flexibility develops. And at that point, I will withdraw uh, uh, some of the extra generation capacity. Again, that's a, an interesting sort of narrative, but in practice, I guess, uh, Doug may be uh, more uh, sort of assertive on this uh, for sure, but I think investors uh, will want to see some flexibility independently of the level of support that you give uh, to demand side flexibility. I mean, investors want to be convinced uh, that what they are doing is going to be useful in the future, independently of whether you, you pay them a lot of subsidies to, uh, to do it. So in my perspective, the main obstacle to the development of uh, behind the meter flexibility is uh, the lack of price uh, volatility. Because I think in most countries, there are tools uh, to, to pass on to consumers uh, uh, wholesale price volatilities, volatility, but they're not used. They're not used because there is not enough volatility. It's not worth it. 
Okay, um, I think uh, we are getting towards the, the, the end of this debate, but I still have one question which I would like to put all of you, and I would be grateful if you could um, spend only one, uh, one minute to, uh, to reply to it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on the ability of all of us, of regulators, but also stakeholders, etc., to come up with the right regulatory framework um, for a system which would be increasingly interconnected. So we'll have the electricity network, we'll have the gas network, the hydrogen network, the heat network, um, to the extent that it might be uh, regulated. And uh, one, 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 one of our participants uh, is asking, um, are we you know, are we um, are we able uh, to, to to come up with a, with a, with a, with a with a proper regulatory approach? And then I will add another one that has just come now: um, Is our markets not enough to give the right signal to storage? Do we need to regulate storage? Can we not just leave uh, the market to to, to provide uh, the signals uh, to, to to have enough storage? So um, one minute each. Um, maybe we can start in reverse. Order so Benoit, Doug, Guido, and then um, uh, Ronnie and and, and Carol. Um, so well, um, Benoit. Yeah, no. Uh, One minute. I I don't have the answer. I'm afraid. But let's talk about um, let's say methodology. Regulation is something which is living, and the proper regulation today may not be the ones uh, which will be appropriate in ten years. So what is important to me is to have some flexibility in terms of, uh, of rules and to, to adapt the rules of the game progressively according to the evolution of the, of the systems, acknowledging the fact that regulation has an effect also on what can be delivered. But you know, I would, uh, I would defend a, a flexible approach to regulation and to progressively adapt according to the changes occurring in the world. Thank you, Benoit. Doc? Uh, let, me, let me take the second question just with a story. I remember, uh, I remember a discussion I had in the, in the GB market when we were looking at the use of vol, the value of lost load, to, um, to, to set very high prices in the market and what level of vol would be required in order to encourage people to invest in storage. And the conversation I had within a company went sort of like this. Well, if we say we build storage and once in 20 years, it requires the price to reach X you know, million euros per, per, per megawatt hour um, in order to be called and justify that investment. Can you imagine the headline when one um, you know, grandmother freezes to death in the dark and your headline says, the Dugwood company price gouges the market at a million euros a, a megawatt hour while somebody dies. No one is going to touch that kind of investment. Just the reputational risk of doing that just would make, and, and uh, it, it kind of destroyed a lot of the arguments that Ofgem was considering at the time about pure use of pricing signal, especially during times of extreme scarcity. So you've got to be, you've got to be very careful about that. Electricity is not a normal, is not a standard good. Uh, we do. Um, well, yes, I, I think those, of us, those among us that are over 50 have uh, gone through uh, times of uh, full monopoly uh, and also times of uh, competition euphoria, if you like. And now we're back to times in which, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, there is a temptation to, 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 to go back to uh, public intervention, regulation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I mean, this is all very, un I think it's understandable, not because uh, we saw major failures uh, in, in, in the markets, but just because the situation today is quite exceptional in terms of need for investment, uh, uh, pressure to decarbonization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think a balanced position could be that we need to keep having sort of trust, uh, putting trust in the markets because we were, they have not disappointed us massively so far. Uh, whereas sometimes the public intervention did actually in the past. So uh, while we accept that temporarily, maybe we need to sort of put a bit more emphasis on regulation, public intervention, capacity remuneration, uh, transfer of risk uh, on consumers from investors. I think in the long run, uh, we can be quite uh, uh, sort of optimistic about the, the role of the markets. 
Thank you, Guido. Carol, your take on yeah. this issue? Yes, thank you very much. First thing um, I would say to give an answer, this is the problem with the storage paradox. As, as we have storage and the right capacity, which is required in the system, we can demonstrate our value, which is in a way not easy to explain. But for sure, if the capacity is going to be reduced, I think we won't have to explain anything because the market will react. Then another point, um, I think that now we have a lot of consumer who are very proud and I can understand that they have their own solar panel with their own batteries, but when they don't have the capacity that they require, suddenly they ask the market. In a way, they ask the system to provide something. And for sure, they don't pay the, they don't pay for the right capacity, which is suddenly so high that we have to do all the services needed with high ramping capability that they don't have to look at because we do it now with the regulation we have. But I'm quite sure that without the, without the support of the right regulation and the right market design, that they can rely on their solar panel with electric batteries only, that's for sure. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, Ronnie. Alberto, it's going to be difficult to, to add something to that, but I would like to return to what I learned from you and other people in regulation. You should regulate those things because they are a monopoly. And whenever it's not a monopoly, you better leave it to the market. And if I go back to storage, this is not a monopoly. So it should not be regulated. That's my basic, and if it's, whether it's storage, whether it's generation or whether it's demand or whether it's flexibility demand or flexible generation, it's not a monopoly. So don't touch it. That would be my humble advice from over 60 even. Okay. Uh, Lee, Lee, welcome back. Uh, I think we, we missed you for, for, for a few minute, minutes. Um, uh, I don't know whether you, we have still three minutes to go. I don't know whether you, we, you want to add something to, to, to the debate until now. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry, I lost my connection. I had a problem getting back on again. It was um, really unfortunate because I was very much uh, enjoying all the discussions and the, and the questions that were going backwards and forwards. But um, I, I, I think when I started off, I said there were probably going to be more questions than there were answers. Um, I, I was intrigued by some of the chat um, and what I thought one approach was very interesting is what do we now define as a, a public service? And is that to be then the starting point for uh, regulation rather than looking at networks and looking at monopolies, but actually working back from the interests of, of the consumer or the, the customer? I'm, I'm not sure that that will provide all the answers, but I thought that that was an interesting um, depart point of departure. I, I don't know if you maybe had a chance to explore that, but... Uh, uh, thank you, Lee. No, we didn't explore that. In fact, actually, your remark and, and, and Ronnie's remark actually is, is, is bringing us back to, to square one, you know. Uh, when things become complex, it's not a bad idea to go back to first principles and ask yourself, you know, are we not getting too complicated and we should be sort of go back to the drawing board and, and, and with some basic principles. So what is a public service? What is a monopoly? And, and then... Um, Proceed accordingly, and that would also be probably a way of um, of dealing with the with the question that we had. You know, would we be up to the task of coming up with um, with with a consistent regulatory approach for so many sectors, infrastructure that are going to be increasingly interlinked? I think we've run now come to the end of it. Um, I don't know if there are conclusions, Ali. I don't think there are conclusions. We've come up with more questions than answer. Um, at least this is my view, but that's uh, nice about these debates as well. Um, Lee, do you want to say two words of conclusion? We have less than a minute. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've already made that we're already three words. Um, I think uh, these debates I th are uh, always fascinating and, and very rich. I think they're very important given that uh, the Commission is conducting them not just the fit um, for 55 exercise, but trying to mirror then gas with electricity, uh, the various initiatives that are all ongoing. 
Um, I don't think any of us would perhaps like to be in the Commission's shoes right now, um, as it's, I think, such a complex task, but these debates really, I think, show that that complexity is not going to be resolved easily and a lot of thinking needs to be done uh, to find solutions that are durable and that will take us to um, 2050. So thank you very much uh, to the speakers, the panelists and to the audience um, for um, an excellent afternoon. And uh, we'll see you in a month's time. I'll hand the floor back to Alberto for final remarks. Also, thank you to the, um, the team in Florence uh, for facilitating everything um, today very professionally and expertly. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And yes, it's, uh, for me, it's just to thank again all the participants, um, all the panelists the, 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 um, for, um, for being with us, Carol, uh, Reni, uh, Ronnie, uh, Doug, um, Benoit, Guido, for uh, a lively debate. Um, the, 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 the next debate of this series will be about energy efficiency at the end of the month on the 31st of, uh, of, of March. It will be advertised soon. Um, but then there will also be another debate on pyrolysis uh, in two weeks' time. Um, and this will be run in the morning, but watch this space, watch um, our website if you want to know more. So that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot to Chiara, as always, uh, for supporting us and to make this possible. And um, see you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you.